see two different stories in the book of uh, chapter 5. We didn't read none of 5. We stopped at 5. Uh, I thought we read till uh, they buried. Yeah, we, we yeah. I think you missed a day. You, you were, did, yeah. You we, weren't here. You we know. read where they buried Ananias and Sapphira for promising to God and not coming through. Um, and they buried her. It was right before they gave up their soul for the ghost. It's about verse 10 is where we're at. About yep. okay. and this was, And the discussion we were having was about making promises to God. And, uh, um, you know, they made a promise to God that he didn't necessarily tell them they had to make. The other people didn't ask them to make it either. No, and they made this promise, and what happened was is they got more than they thought they were going to get. It's really lied. They didn't make a promise. They just plain lied. Well, yeah, they lied to God, basically. Uh, but even throughout the chapter and through the end of the chapter, there is a common theme with this chapter, and it's basically about our commitment to God. Uh, their commitment was not there in their promise and their lie. They did not, they did not finish what they said they would do. And then we see Peter and John and the others uh, standing up against persecution uh, for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love the end of this chapter. The chapter it's, there's a line in here that just we won't get to it that I just absolutely love. Um, but when we make a promise and commitments to God, God expects us to what? Did you keep it all oh, very well? And we should be that way with anybody. If we, there are some things, things that we do say that become out of our ability to keep, and I understand that. Uh, but our intentions should always be to fulfill the promise that we have been, that we have made, uh, and Ananias and Sapphira made a promise, and they they flat out lied. They they did not give uh, what they said they were going to give, and, and you know this seems like a drastic um, ending to that because if we think about the times that we've made a promise to God and not kept it. Uh, we could have wound up like Ananias and Sapphira. And that's scary to think about, you know. Uh, but I think that, that possibly their intentions never were to give. And never were to, to give the right amount. Uh, and I think that that might be a difference, you know. Um, I, I can say, and, and, and the bad side is I failed on a lot of my promises to God. But the good side is, I can say that every promise I've ever made to God, I intended to keep. Um, I've never just flat out lied to God. Number one, I've known from a child up that it was useless to lie to God because he knows everything anyway. So, you know, I've never made a promise that I did not intend to keep. And, I, and I've been that way with people as well. Um, but yet, you know, I have not held up my end of the bargain on many occasions, and I think everybody's been in that boat before, where we where we intended to to do something or intended to be something, uh, and we fall, fell short of what we said we would do. Um, but there are times, that, and let's say a contractor gives you a quote, and he says, we're going to do this much work and this kind of work for this amount of money. That's a promise that they will complete what they say they'll complete. Uh, there are jobs where a contractor does intend to keep his promise, but then after multiple quarrels <laughs> with those they are working for, kind of forgets what, what they promised. And then they don't keep it. And I'm not saying that's any better but there are occasions where a contractor says, well, I'll do this, this, and this, and it's all a scam, where they don't intend to do what they promised they would do. They don't keep those promises, never even intending to, to be what they said uh, or do what they said they were going to do. So I, I'm not saying that the sin is greater. The promise is still not kept. Either way, the end result is the same. Uh, but I do believe that most people that make a promise to God do intend to keep that promise. Um, but yet, regardless whether it's circumstances that that 
lead us away from keeping that promise or we never intended to do it, the result is the same. We didn't do what we said we were going to do. And I think that uh, uh, I know in my crazy, busy schedule, I promise people, oh, I'll, do, I'll take care of that or I'll be here, I'll do this, and I forget. And it's not that I intend to, to, to not do those things, but, but yet I do forget. Uh, and if I don't write something down, it's gone. And you'll see me sometimes, you'll tell me something and I'll write a text real quick. I'm usually sending that to Jennifer or something. And she gets these texts sometimes and she doesn't even respond because she knows why I sent it. Because I have in, you know, typing what I was supposed to remember, you know. And every once in a while, I'll be working, my phone will chime, and I'll look at it, and it'll be her. She'll have a phone number she sent me. All that is, <laughs> is to remember that phone number. It's there so that she can, you know, remember what, what it is that uh, she intended to remember. remember. Uh, but... You're lucky that her wife has got a good memory. <laughs> she indeed does. I have not been blessed with a good memory. Um... There are certain things that I remember that are useless. Why I remember them, I don't know. And then there are some things that are pretty important that I just slip. They're gone. Uh, and uh, I'm just wired that way. I, I don't know how to be any different. Uh, and uh, if you try to change me, that's not going to work either. <laughs> but uh, um, I think that intent is weighed out. With God, I, I think God takes into the account that we did intend to keep our promise. We did in, intend to pay that debt, or we did intend uh, to do what we said we were going to do. Uh, but yet, as good stewards of what God has given us, we should only make promises within what God has provided. Uh, and I think that... Uh, you know, I understand faith, and I understand these things, and I understand stepping out on faith and giving and promising something, but, you know, I've heard preachers preach to a, a, a group that if God has given you a number, you just write that check and, and let God fill in the blank. And I'm like, well, I think God gives us enough sense to know that that's not in our account. Uh, that's it's not you know, in your account. You best not put that number down on a check. Yes, I feel that way. Um, but yet, I don't want to take away from if God's saying, you know, I think you can, you can pledge this much per month or something to, to whatever it is, um, and you're not sure how you're going to get it. I, 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 there's a line there, okay? There, there's a place where it's a God-given, driven uh, command or, or, or a leading. Uh, but then, you know, I've sat through sermons where they were talking about planting a seed, and the seed was money. It wasn't about sowing the seed of the gospel. It was about giving something you didn't have uh, or couldn't afford to give in order to God to just multiply it and make it much bigger. And I, I, I know they'll throw this at me. God says, bring into my house the tithes and offerings and see if I won't open up. He says, try me in this, that I won't open up the windows of heaven. I get that. But if you're giving the money with the thought process, God's going to make this a lot bigger. No, he's not. <laughs> he, he's not. You're not giving it because you want God to have it. You're giving it because you think the promise of that blessing's coming. That I don't agree with. Now, if you're giving, given because God said, I want you to give this much, and you're like, okay, God... I don't know how I'm going to give this much and still pay my electric bill. If God is saying give this much, what should you do? He's going to take care of the electric bill. Uh, that's different than thinking you're going to get to pay the electric bill because you're going to quadruple your, your investment. Giving to God is not an investment in money. It's not. It's, it's, it's an act of obedience. And if it's given in the right attitude and the right... Um, a direction of the Lord, God will absolutely bless it. And I believe that God will monetarily bless you if you give where he tells you to give. I think the blessing is that meeting the need. We were just actually just talking about this earlier because like we I want to stick with the 10% because I personally mm -hmm. feel convicted. That's what God wants me to pay. And 
sometimes I look at it and I'm like, I, you know, it looks like we can't pay that. But I assure him, like, if we give this, God will bless it and he will make sure that we have everything we need. That's right. So, like, even if it looks like we're not going to have enough, if we, if we still pay that and give that to God, God's going to bless it in the form of meeting our needs. You That's know, right. To meet the about, need. Meet the needs. You we're might not get about, a check in the mail, yeah. but the needs are going to right. be Right, so we yes. might get, you know, like, we'll stuff a little drink and running water and grocery money. So these are things that God knows we need. You know, he needs those monetary needs, what, what's necessary. And so I thought of something during Sunday school, and I don't exactly remember what triggered this thought, but it wasn't something I needed to interject <laughs> at that point, but it was just something that I thought. And for some reason, and in our discussion, I don't remember exactly what we were talking about at that moment, but I was thinking about God providing what we need when we need it. And I was thinking that if I have the money to go get it, I might say, well, God blessed me and I was able to get it. But who do I really think got it? When I go spend the money to get it, I feel like, I earn the money to go get it. And I think sometimes when God provides the money to get something, we don't depend on him as well or give him the credit as much as when he provides the something without the money because it took me completely out of the equation. You see what I'm saying? It's just like I've shared this with you just recently about needing new tires uh, one time. And I was praying for God to give me the money somehow to get these new tires. Give me some work or something so I can get these new tires. Well, God gave me the new tires instead of the money to get the tires. And I felt like it kept me more dependent on Him. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and I had that thought this morning, and I don't remember exactly why I thought or what point of the conversation uh, I thought that. Uh, but I was thinking, you know, I mean, it would be, you, you feel, I think when you get that cushion in the bank account and you've got that money to buy, you would say, thank you, God, for the means that you've given me to buy. I get that. But I think we rely on money. Even though God gave it to us, we rely on money. But when we don't have money and we have the need and the need shows up, then we can't even put ourselves or money in the equation. It's all what? God's provision. It's all God giving to us. So, um, I, And that's kind of a small thing, I guess. But yet it was a thought that I had. And I thought, you know, I am closer to God when I don't know how I'm going to get something accomplished. When everything seems like it's in place... And I kind of have a plan, which is unheard of for me. But I have a plan on how everything's going to get accomplished, whether it's money, scheduling, whatever. Then I'm, I'm more, I'm not as much to keep relying on him. But when I, there is a struggle each day, I think the struggle causes me to rely on him more often. Does that make sense? Um, I think if it's too easy... I start taking it for granted. And I quit thinking about that God provided. And as long as there's a struggle, it reminds me that I am not of myself. I can't do things in and of myself. I have to rely on God for each and everything uh, that I do and each and everything uh, that I accomplish. And, you know, and this might be a trivial thing to some, but, you know, the thought of sitting in the woods for a day by myself sounded pretty good you know get away just just relax and and uh you know i was kind of towards midday i was sitting there thinking i can't believe i haven't seen a deer yet you know and then i got to thinking about what i had seen the squirrels were busier than i've ever seen them and a lot of and that's right and i had i got this pop-up blind you know, and I got some windows open or whatever. But there was a squirrel trying to poke his head under the back of the blind because he didn't know what was in there. I had them so close to me. I had one climb up on top of the blind. I, I had squirrels at three feet. 
And I, you know, how often do you get to watch a wild animal that close? And the doves would come and go. They were going to the pond, and then they would leave. They'd come back, and then they would leave. And, and it was interesting. A dove, to me, when I'm hunting them, is there's one shoot. You don't really watch them. You, you just harvest them. And I got to watch their activities and learn a whole lot from them. And, you know, and I, I was sitting there thinking, how much I go out, and I sit in a blind to shoot a deer, and the deer shows up and I shoot it and I go and take care of it and I go about my business. How much of the little stuff did I not even notice? You know, and there was this little songbird about this big. I don't know his name, but he was orange and, and, and green and had all kinds of pretty colors and blues. And he flew right into the, the rail on the, the, the blind's called a hub. The whipper will. Huh? The whipper will. Was it? Yeah. Well, it flew right into the blind and landed like four feet from me and just just looked at And he sat there for a while. It was almost like he was saying hello. <laughs> <laughs> and then he flew off. Do you know how many times I don't pay attention to that little bird? But the detail, the artwork that God has created in that little bitty bird was just incredible. And, you know, it helped me because instead of being frustrated that I hadn't seen what I was after, because I hadn't seen what I was after, I noticed a lot of things that I had been missing. And, you know, that went on, and, and I, I will say this, 11 hours in a blind is a long time. <laughs> I did take a one-hour break, or it would have been 12 hours. Uh, but uh, because in our family, we use the deer. Our deer season is hamburger. That's what it's about. And <laughs> like big horns, I like all that, but I'm after, you know, the food. And it does save us a lot of money because I don't buy the newest stuff every year. I don't have to buy a box of shells every year because I only shoot my deer gun at deer. And a box of shells for my gun, I think, is $30, and you get 20 shells. And if I'm only shooting it at deer, and I can shoot two or three deer a year. That, that box lasts a while, you know. Um, I don't have to buy new camo. The hat I'm wearing is, it's Paul Paul's hat. Ever since I put it on, I've killed deer. So I, I wear it every time I go out. Not that I think there's any real power in it, just kind of a tradition. You know, I, I don't buy new stuff to go out and hunt. We, I package it all myself, I process it all myself, I do the burger. Uh, it's about getting food for my family and enjoying my time outside. So, you know, I'm not being, I'm not picky. I just, I wanted a big body deer just simply because for my tag, they're more money or more, more meat for the money. Um, so the second shift, I go back in, I, 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 I eat, and use the restroom and, and just kind of warm up. And I go back out and I sit in the blind and hour turns into more hours and hours turn into more hours and the doves are doing their thing. And, and, I, and I found myself that, you know, I have talked to God continuously more today than I have for a long, long, long time. And just about the time I said, well, God, I guess it's not today. I thought, I really thought this is not going to happen today. I had five minutes left of legal shooting. Life. Five minutes after being in the blind for 11 hours. And I hear a noise, and I look to my left, and I'm thinking, well, the squirrels seem to have already quit and went to bed. And I'm looking, and I'm looking, I can't see nothing to my left, so I glance back to my right, and I had misjudged where the sound had come from. And there he stood, 25 yards from the blind, chip shot for anybody, just standing there, just perfect. And with, with less than five minutes of shooting light left, I got the deer. And... Um, I was just, I was just that, uh, you know, I know that was a long wait, but thank you, God, for the day. Thank you for the time in the blind. Thank you for uh, the time out in nature. And, and uh, you know, I, I, I think I, that there's some squirrels there that are like me that need some Weight Watchers. <laughs> there's some fox squirrels there that, man, they, they must be ahead of everybody at the, at the walnut tree. I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but there's some healthy squirrels. And, and uh, i got a feeling that me and the kids are going to make another trip to Paul <laughs> and try to clean up on some squirrels for some squirrel dumplings. <laughs> but, uh, um, 
just little bitty things. And I, I had a gray squirrel. That gray squirrel was three foot away. And I could just, the mannerisms and the little things that you can't see from a long ways away. Just, you know, when you're squirrel hunting, you don't look at that stuff. You just shoot it, you know. Uh, but yet, you know, God's provision. Sometimes, and what it taught me, and I know it seems trivial, but what it taught me was what I wanted was to go out there and get a deer. And what I wanted was Saturday morning for one to walk right out after daylight and let me shoot it. But God had a lesson for me yesterday. And I would not have received the blessing of that lesson if it wasn't for the many hours and the long sit in the blind. So how does that relate to life? Well, how many things do we want to happen right now? Not that God doesn't intend for it to happen, but the process of getting there, there's a whole lot of stuff we need to know and learn and experience and, and, and uh, you know, and, and just connect with God. And, and, you know, there are guys that it's all about getting that big deer, that big antler, the big rack, which I, I am excited if I get a big deer. I really am. Uh, but I think that if we stop, and, and this can apply to anything that you do. Whatever God has given you a passion for, um, you can see and be, be experience, you can experience God through anything that God has put. We're all different. Every one of us have different uh, talents. We have different hobbies. Um, and every one of our, our things that we enjoy, uh, God can definitely speak to us. And God shows us. I think the problem is, is we don't stop and... Listen, we get too focused on the need at hand. Um, yes, I was talking about a hunt, but if you go back to getting the tires that I needed, and this happened a few years ago, I told you the story. We need to let God provide the need and not worry about it so much. And when you're not worried about the accomplishing what you need for the need, that helps you in your communication with God up to that point. If we have a full faith in God that he's going to provide, without that worry in our life, I think we connect to him better as we're waiting on him to fulfill the need. Um, God said that he would provide us everything that we need, he would never leave us nor forsake us. I think the problem lies in our definition of need. What do we need? Well, food? Yeah. <laughs> I'm with you. First I like food. Yeah, huh? water, food. God, Our water, place food. to sleep. Shelter. Clothes to wear. Clothes. Not Nikki Baby's, huh? <laughs> Food, water, shelter, clothing. I think in this country, for sure, we are very spoiled. And what we think we need is money. Is money, yeah. My dad's not <laughs> Sometimes I think we need a reality check. Truly need. Um, you know, I think I shared with you about volunteering at the food pantry, and a lady came in and she asked if we had any dish soap. And that was not something that we gave out, that was in food. I don't know, we don't have any dish soap. Okay. Thank you, though. You know, she went about it. I was just I was doing something else, and it dawned on me we had a little kitchenette at the place where people like bring in cakes and eat or whatever. And they always wash the dishes in there, you know. And I thought, wait a minute, I think there was a bottle of dish soap in there. I'd imagine the next time they had a little meeting there, food, they didn't have any dish soap to wash their <laughs> dishes with. But I went in there and I grabbed that half of a bottle of dish soap and I came out and gave it to her. I said, I found this back here. And she started crying over getting dish soap. Because she would clean her dishes and it was water. 
and she just felt like she wasn't getting them clean for her family to eat on. But she didn't have any dish soap, didn't have any money to get any. And, you know, it, when, when she started crying over receiving dish soap, I really kind of, it took me back a little bit. I'm like, hmm. You know, I've never not been able to have dish soap. I forgot it. <laughs> but I've never been in the position where I couldn't have any. And I thought, you know, how spoiled are we? And, and to see what people actually truly need. You know, uh, missionaries will come back and they'll talk about what they need and what they, uh, what the people need. And, uh, you know, they just... Uh, I seen something the other day that somebody uh, put a picture somewhere of a, a list of what's uh, this was what some it was a foster ch or it was a child at a uh, um, in a not a foster not a foster home but a orphanage uh, their Christmas list you know and on it was socks uh, food. parents that don't fight or hit me, you know. Um, it was just like the things that were listed were the things that we just take for granted. Had. Yeah, we have them. We take it for granted, you know. And um, I'm not sure how we got here from promises to God. Uh, but um, God's promise to us is to give us what we need. And I think when we truly are reminded about what needs are basis, uh, compared to what wants are, you know, even in what they consider poverty in our country is considered extremely wealthy uh, in other countries. Um, running water in the house, right? Indoor plumbing. How amazing is that? Do you remember Betty going to the outhouse in the dead of winter when it was three degrees? That's a cold little box, wasn't it? And you got out there and you had to you had to hurry. But you had to expose yourself to the cold in order to use that thing. You know? And uh, we go in there and turn the light on and got hot water in the shower and we, you know, we got this instant Hot water, we use it up, and just in a, an hour, we were ready to roll again. We got this electric stove with pots and pans and microwaves. You know, how much do we use a microwave, you know? Um, I will tell you this. At negative 10 degrees, a porta potty on a job site is one of the coldest things on the planet. <laughs> just so you know. <laughs> I, I absolutely know for a fact that that is true. Uh, but I remember, I, I think I told you this, but I knew a lady whose uh, dad, when, when, when they were, when houses were starting to get indoor plumbing and, and they were going to build a house, and the kid said something about, we'll get a bathroom inside. And he said, why would anybody want to do that in the house? You know, he, he just couldn't comprehend why anybody would use the bathroom in the house, you know, that's outside, you know, you understand what he was thinking, he wasn't comprehending that you send it down the pipe and it goes outside, you never have to deal with it, you know, until you have a sort of problem, then you have to deal with it, uh, but, uh, you know, the things that we have and the things that we are blessed with, you know, God has gone way above and beyond what we what we think that we need. Um, you know, if I had not shot a deer, we'd still eat at my house. We'd still have food. That was not going to be an issue to where we were going to starve. I knew that. Um, it was a want. Yes, a need, but not a desperate need. Uh, and God would have provided other ways for us to have meat like that. Uh, but I can say this. There was one time uh, when it was just me and the boys, and I didn't have any work. The work I was working with ran out of work. There was no work, 
and I had already bought my bow tag for the year, and I'd paid the bills, and I had about ten bucks, and I had to get the boys back and forth to school all week and eat, and we were just about out of everything, and I thought, you know, I'm gonna go deer hunting with my bow, and, and see if I can't get us something to eat, you know, and I was sitting in this deer blind. And uh, it was the first time I had actually ever hunted and really felt that I needed to kill something so that we could eat for the, for the month, you know. And I, I, I'd never been to that point before. And I was, I was praying, and it, it was different because, and, and I, I, I got a glimpse of what it was to pray to harvest something in order to eat. Um, had I not got that deer, I, God would have provided another means. I know that. Uh, but I was out there with that boat praying for a deer so that we could have food. Uh, and lo and behold, here come this nice, perfect size little button buck at eight yards. I'd never had a deer give me that kind of shot in my life. You know, eight yards and the arrow found its mark and the deer didn't go far. And for the next month, we had a lot of deer meat at our house. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I can think of the boys come in and just assume that's what we were having with deer. Because, <laughs> you know, I still had that, you know, $10 had to buy gasoline to go back and forth to school. You know, we we had, we had drank water and we, we ate deer. And I baked it and I fried it and I boiled it. And I, <laughs> I did all kinds of stuff and I did some barbecue sandwiches with it. And I, I made it up to be, you know, I changed it up a bit. Um, but, you know, we think we know so many times what we need. And in reality, God knows what we need ever before we need it. Uh, you know, and, and I remember thinking this morning about the blessings that God provides. There are so many blessings that God provides that we don't even know. How would I know if God helped me avoid an accident? I mean, there are sometimes people figure that out because of circumstances around them. But there are things that God does for us that we never know he did. Because if we did know, then, then it would have happened. You understand what I'm saying? So I think sometimes we forget that the blessings we see are just the surface of the blessings that we don't see. It's kind of like the ocean. You know, Ken Holman, the, the, the Holman videos was talking about, he was talking to some guy about how enormous the ocean was. They were looking at the ocean, how big it was. And the guy turned and looked at him and said, that's just the top of it. It's just the top of it. That's the surface. You know, there's so much down in there that they don't know about. They still find new creatures down there that they baffle them. But anyway. Yeah, actually, they've only discovered 30% of the entire ocean. Yeah, that's amazing. Isn't that crazy? You know, but, but you look at the ocean and that's just the top of it. You know? And... I was thinking about the, the earth, the boys and I, they, they're boys, they were talking about a tunnel all the way through the earth, and if you jumped in it, and you fell all the way to the center, would you shoot past the other side, but then once you're on the other side, would you fall back? Because that's down from the other side. <laughs> they're both down, you know. But, you know, if you look directly, you know, you can't see it. If you drew a line from here to the other side of the world, how much is between here and there? A lot. A lot of stuff we don't even comprehend. They can't journey to the center of the earth. They can't do it. But yet it's there, isn't it? How much between here and the other side of the world is there? We just see mo mostly the surface. Even the mines that go deep, that's still the surface of the earth. We're not even breaking the surface. The deepest trenches in the ocean are just the surface of the earth. And look what's there. Look what's just in the surface, you know. I look at the blessings from God in the same way. Uh, and, you know, I guess this does tie into to what we're talking about here because why promise to give God anything? Because he gave stuff for us. I agree with that. But in reality, what does everything belong to? God. God, that's right. So, God owns everything anyway. So, what can I give God? Just yourself. Yourself and everything. Don't think you really get that as yourself. Love. Love? That's a good one. I totally.
totally agree with that one, bud. And, and, you know, what do you, you just around Christmas time? What do you give that person who just had everything already? You know, and, and you think about the holidays. I'm sure there are a few gifts that you remember getting growing up in the holidays, but what do you mostly remember? I'm not growing up, so. <laughs> You're not grown up. Well, don't don't grow up yet. You know, and, and either good or bad, the memories usually aren't around the physical thing you did or didn't get. What's it about? The people that you were with. The people that you were with. The the family and the time spent. And and, and like I said, it doesn't have to be a good memory. It could be a bad memory also. But yet the memories are what you think about when you think about the holidays and you think about the past. So how trivial is the item you get? Right? You know, time with each other is the most important. And I think if you think about what can I give God, I turn my life over to Him. He already has my life. Everything I own belongs to him. It's all his. It was that way in earthly kingdom. People had stuff, but in reality, if the king said, I, it was his. He, wanted, he took it. It was, it was king's. Everything in the kingdom belonged to him. Everything belongs to God. If I'm a believer, and he already owns everything in my life, he already owns me, I belong to him, there's really only one true thing I can give him. Time. Time. That's all I can give him because everything else belongs to him. I can give my time to other places and other things, to people, to whatever it might be. Uh, but yet God wants my time. So many promises we make that Rabbi did come back. So many promises we make that really, God, if you do this, I'll just do this. Or God, even if it's not a bargain, even if it's God, I'm sorry, I'm just going to do this. You know, I plan on doing this and this and this. That's all good. There's nothing wrong with trying to uh, be better about doing the commands of God. But even when we mess up, the one thing he still wants more than anything is our time. And if you sit down with a child and play whatever game they want to play, it really has nothing to do with the game you're playing. What do they want? I heard a, I heard a little story, and I, whether it's true or not, but the little boy asked his mom, you know, how much daddy made at work an hour. And uh, she didn't really telling and you know it was just the, the, the story was kind of long but it was a short point to it but in the end she asked him why he wanted to know why why did it matter to him what well, daddy made an hour and he said well if I could get daddy to come home from work an hour early then I could pay him that hour so that I could what he needed for that hour so I could have an hour of time with him and you know and and I know that I could drive an hour or two every day and I could probably double my income. But I wouldn't be home very much. I wouldn't enjoy my job near as much. And all for the sake of what? More money. I feel like in my life, I would much rather have less money but be home with my family and available for, for whatever with my family than I would be with the money. Uh, because one day, they're going to put me in the ground and any money I made is going to be what? Um. Gone. If there's, any, if there's any left, it'd be someone else's, right? 
whatever part of my family is still around, whether it be Jennifer or the kids or whatever, they're going to get whatever money. And I can't take it with me. I can't take any of that. And, and you know, very seldom does anybody on their deathbed say, I wish I'd have made more money. Mm-hmm. Well, they always wish. If there was someone there with them that they cared about that really good and I loved them. We just had a couple of days. Had more time with them, yeah. yeah. With my boys. and um, Like, it's really important to me because I feel like they're, they're growing up in a world that it's bigger, better, more, more, more. Bye, 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 have, have, have. Yep, high know? fast pace. It is. And so I'm trying to really, I really want to get it into them that all that stuff, having all those things, when you die, you can't take them with you. What you leave behind is important. That's right. And what you leave behind by the people in your life. And so the difference that you make in the world with the people around you and how much you love God, that will last. That will span centuries because you can pass it on. You know, truly it's unending. And that, what you leave behind will never die because it can be carried on down the line. Little things make such a difference in people's lives. And sincerity is one of those things. And, 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 and that genuine love or genuine conversation, and people remember things like that much more than anything you've done or what you've accomplished. Um, um, my father-in-law tells the story that when uh, George Bush Sr. was vice president, he was put on whatever duty to, a couple, two, two times to uh, guard the president, or the vice president. He said the first time that uh, Bush got off the plane, he walked up to him and said, uh, uh, what's your name, Sergeant? Something like that. And he said, uh, Brian Cox. And he said, you got family? And he told him about Jennifer and Jessica. And a little bit of small talk, and he went on. And like six months later, he was put on the duty again. Vice President walks off the plane. Walks up to Brian, says, hello, Sergeant Cox. How's Jen and Jesse doing? And he was just, he remembered my kids' names, you know. And that meant something to him because he didn't just passively ask him a question just to whatever and be presidential and go on. He actually listened. And... I would do good to remember somebody's name and ask them questions about their kids. I guarantee you that. Uh, and whether you like George Bush Sr. or not, or whatever, that's not the point. The point is, it meant something to, to Brian that the man listened enough to remember his children's name. Um, you know how when you tell somebody something, and six months later they ask you a question, and the answer is exactly what you told them? How do you feel? You feel like they did not listen, right? Um, I've told Jim for more than one occasion, I do listen to you, honey, I promise, because I'll ask her a question that she's already given me the answer to, and I can't remember or didn't even remember I asked it. And and it, it bothers us. When somebody doesn't recall that we spoke to them about something or whatever it might be. Uh, but when they do remember, we feel like they listened and that they, they cared enough to, to understand. And, and that time that we give people means more to them than anything you know we can physically give them. Um, just a, a visit, a stop to talk or... or uh, whatever it might be, you know, your kids will remember you sitting down and having a conversation with them uh, much longer and much deep, deeper than they'll remember that certain gift that you gave them that they wanted. Um, and, you know, when I think about my loved ones that have gone on, I never think, boy, I wish I could borrow their such and such again. Or I wish I could, you know, have this again or that again. What's that? What do I always want? It'd be nice to have another day. Just, just God, one more day would be very wonderful, you know, or have another moment, have another uh, conversation, you know. Those are the things that matter. And all of those things take one thing. And that is our time. I was going to ask you a question. Why do you think that for certain people, 
store and him decided to keep the money back. What was their, what was their point? It doesn't say they had children that they wanted to keep it so the children would have the money, you know, to take care of the children. It doesn't say they wanted to keep it because they felt like they was going to need the money. It just sounds like they just wanted the money. Just agree. Yeah, uh, agree. 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 And, and there's two ways to look at it. They either really intended to give it, and then when they seen the sum that spoke to them in temptation, and they decided to keep it all, or they never truly intended to give all of it. And I don't think it clearly says which one. Um, but the problem is, I think that, you know, I've heard people say many times, Boy, if I won the lottery, I'd give you a million. They probably wouldn't. Um, and the thing is, is when you think about it, they, when you don't have something, it's easier to talk about giving it away. But when you do have it, you're like, hmm, I have that. Now it's actually hurting me a little to give it. Where when I didn't have it, I could talk about it all day long. And what they had, what they say, the proof is in the pudding, right? I think that the temptation of what they could do with that money just got to them. Um, and, you know... But it kind of seems a little bit harsh that God did what he did. Because he didn't, <laughs> he didn't give him time to think about it. No, they didn't get to repent. They didn't get to... <laughs> he didn't give him no time no. to say, uh, uh, well, now... Let's talk about this or uh, anything. He just okay. Well, and, and but here's and, and this will probably be the only verse we get in tonight. But eleven says, and great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these apostles or heard these people. things. That's the other people. That's not them. I'm just saying though the example that was set was showing them you're either all in or you're not. Um, and, and I think that it may have been that they that they felt like the this Christian movement was kind of the popular thing to them and it was exciting and maybe they truly weren't um, committed to it the way that, that they should be. Uh, and it's very possible that, well, a couple with this kind of deception, what would they cause in the work? Bad stuff. Bad stuff. If they would have got away with this, what would have happened? But the truth is, and even going along with what we've been discussing, if they would have gave what they said, what would God have provided? He would provide. Everything they needed would have been provided. Uh, and you know, the Bible says the love of money yeah, is the of root of all evil. evil. Um, how many, uh, well, the um, horrible things they do when they, the, the, well, when they traffic the young ladies. What's it about? Money. Somebody's getting a lot of money. I was trying to not say certain things. Um, when Paul cast the demons out of that young lady that was following him around, mm -hmm. what made those men mad? Because they lost their money. They lost their means of getting the money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are so many things. Um, why, why are there certain establishments in East St. Louis? Why would these women go and do the things that they do and then the men go and, and be as guilty or more guilty if you want in participating. What's it all about? Money. Somebody's making money. You know? Oh, absolutely. And uh, drugs. They manufacture drugs. Why do, why do they, and why do they uh, smuggle it into the country? They're making money. Making money. Making money. They get these people hooked on these things and then they make all the money. Money does things to people. Um, and 
you know, I guess that sometimes it's a blessing to not have a whole lot of it, because... <laughs> That's what I told him. I was reading about that. I don't know about that. It was a few months ago, but I was reading about um, lottery statistics. And um, I said to read about weird things. But anyways, I saw some article. And uh, like married couples who win more than a million dollars in the lottery, they never, ever stay married. They always get divorced. Mm -hmm. And so, and so I told him, like, See, this is why we're blessed to not be rich because we wouldn't be together probably. Most likely, we would probably get divorced. So, not that we would, but I'm just saying, money really changes people. And I told them that money changes people. And so, like, where I wish we had a little bit more money than we have now, so we can, you know, like, know everything's met. But overall, I really do pray. I know this to me sounds really bizarre to a lot of people, but I pray that God never gives us a whole lot of money. That he just gives us what we need. You're praying, keep me humble, Lord. Yeah, that, that well, really. because here's the thing it changes, it doesn't just change your lifestyle. I, I don't I think there's anything wrong with him. Like King David, he was wealthy, he had a lot of nice things. King Solomon had a lot of nice things. Sometimes God wants people to be wealthy, and he still uses them. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, the majority of people. It changes you spiritually and mentally. There's nothing wrong. It's not a sin to have money. But, and just when I had made a statement, God showed me otherwise, but in heating and cooling, I had been in a lot of houses at the start. And a lot of big, big houses. And it was getting discouraging because you would go to a little farmhouse that had been there for 60 years, that had never had an indoor heating and cooling system other than a wood stove, and they were getting central heat in there. And you'd put this in this house, just this little bitty system, and nine times out of 10, they'd cook you something to eat, and they'd want to help, and sometimes they'd get in the way, but they really wanted to help, and this and that, and then you'd go to this giant house, and the people would treat you like a dog. And I remember thinking, God, if I had to have, if I had to act this way to have money, I don't want it. And and I started feeling a little bit like maybe wealthy people were all like that. And then I did this house, big house. And I had just freshly had that thought. And here come down the steps the wife of the, of the husband, I don't remember who was building this house. And she had a box about this big, full of tins, full of fudge. And I hadn't had, I, I, to even have one of them that could even bake was different, you know. <laughs> and she come down with all this fudge that she had baked for all the people that were working on her house. And it was around Christmas, and she was giving these tins of fudge to everybody. And she would come in, you know, for every few days and just talk and was just the kindest person. And I remember God kind of teaching me a lesson there that I had put wealthy and that attitude together and thought that if you had, if you had money, you acted like this. And then I realized that, no, you don't. There are a lot of people that God has blessed that are good stewards of not just their money, but also their influence and their attitude. And uh, one person that I have always, and I might find out differently, but I think he was done dirty, in my opinion. But the old quarterback for the St. Louis Rams was Kurt Warner. And I found out that used to you'd watch the Super Bowl, and there would be this commercial. And it wouldn't have anybody's church name on it wouldn't say brought to you by this person or nothing. It was just a preacher and a Bible with a very short mm -hmm. statement about are you lost, are you feeling alone, and you need direction in your life? Won't you give Jesus a try? Something like that. He'll change your life. And that was it. That was the whole commercial. Do you know what the minutes or the seconds for a uh, Super Bowl commercial cost? Uh, what you, got? you know who was, huh? Probably more than that. You know who was paying for those commercials? Kurt Warner. He didn't want people to know he was paying for them.
but he was. Uh, he still does that winter warm up. Co or coat, what is it, where they collect coats? Uh, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the organization called Baskets of Hope, where they take um, baskets into uh, hospitals. Uh, these baskets are for families and for terminal children and the families of those children. The baskets will have, a, like for a little boy, they'll have boy-related, you know, coloring books and things in there. But then there's also books in there for the parents that help them deal with grief and with the stress. But it's all influenced by scripture. And Kurt Warner was one of the starting people in that organization. Him, Tony Dungy, who was the uh, uh, coach for the uh, uh, Colts. And Andy Bennis, who was a pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals years ago. Um, they were all involved in getting that thing started and getting it going. And I just feel like those people with that money are using what God gave them to do ministries and do those sorts of things. So that kind of put that back into perspective. So you can be wealthy and still be a good person and still be kind and still be a God-following person. Um, but when the money becomes too important to you, that's when there's a problem. And I've heard people say, I don't even want a lot of money. I just want enough. Well, what's enough? Too much. Uh, <laughs> it's not too much. Too much? What's enough money? There's no limit on enough money because it's like whenever <laughs> I have a friend, she says this all the time, she's like, you know, you see these people who they are wanting a better paying job and they get a better paying job. And then that's not enough. And then they want a better paying job. And then they get a bigger house. And then they get a newer car. And then they need even more money. And then it's like, no matter what, you never truly have enough money because of what you get and what you spend. So. Drake's uh, play that he was in today, uh, his line, he was this fisherman. He uh, had this magic fish come up and was granting wishes. And... Uh, and he, he talked to his wife about this fish, and she said, well, why didn't you wish for this? Why didn't you wish for that? So she had him go back and, and wish for um, nicer clothes, or a nicer house and, ser and, and, and servants. So he went and wished, and they got the nicer house, and they got the servants. Well, then she said, well, go back, because if I'm going to have a nicer house and, and servants, I need to have nicer clothes. So they had to go wish for nicer clothes. And then and then uh, after the nicer clothes, then she made him go back and wish for a bigger house. And eventually uh, she got this uh, nicer, it became a castle. And she said something about, well, now I need to be queen. And uh, in the end, the wish, she went back and, and the fish asked him, well, what do you wish for? He said, what was he? He said, an ocean full of fish and a, a, a comfortable home and a wife that loves me. And poof, the wish was granted. He went home and the castle was gone. The servants were gone. It was just him and her in the, in the humble house. And, and it was just like, it helped. It was saying, you know, you get a little and you want more. You get a little and you want more. You get a little more and you want more. Uh, and it was very relevant to what you just said. And, and um, you know, in the end, what, was, what made them happy? Love, there it goes, having something genuine. Mm -hmm. You could live in a house with a dirt floor and be happy. They're the most satisfied person is not the person that achieved all the things on their checklist. That's not it. The most satisfied person is the person who realizes and understands what they already have. That is the most satisfied person. Contentment. Yeah. So, money. You know, why did, it, why did Ananias and Sapphira lie? Why did they cheat? Why did they do this? Why was God so harsh? Why were there no warnings? Uh, one thing about it, we, we, we read about it, and it's still teaching us today. Uh, and I think, I think there was, a, it made it very clear to the church, this, this is not a game. The people that were saying they were going to be committed to the growth of the church, this was not a club. This is not uh, for popularity. This is for 
for the Lord. And anybody looking and seeing what happened, what did it say to them? Don't do what they did. Don't do what they did. Right? Be careful what you promise. Be careful what you promise. Be satisfied with what you've got, huh? Never mind. Be satisfied with what God has provided. And remember, what is the true focus? Share the gospel. Teach people about Jesus Christ. And, and we didn't get into the last half of the chapter. I love the last half of this chapter. Uh, but Peter and John and those begin to, the threatening becomes even stronger. And there's an imprisonment. And, and I don't want to read it now. We'll talk about it. But um, the boldness that they have in this book of Acts is just absolutely incredible. And sometimes, you know, I wish, I think Christians today are too nonchalant, if you will, about their faith and about sharing the gospel. Um, we don't share it as though it's life or death. But in reality, it is. It is. Um, you know, I, I used to do this little thing uh, when I was a youth pastor. And I had this canister, and it, it was supposedly full of medicine. It was full of candy. And, uh, and the spiel went on about, it was a long, drawn-out thing to prove the point, but it was basically, if your loved one had a disease, and you knew that there was a cure, what would you do? You'd seek out the cure, and then you would give it to them. If there was this pill that would take away the thing that was killing them, you would do everything under your power to convince them to take it, right? And you would, you would, you would climb mountains. You would, you would dig tunnels. You would do anything necessary. To convince them to take this medicine that you've acquired for them. And, you know, the, the spiel is, is that we have what everybody needs to have eternal life. They're dead. And we have the thing that will make them alive. And yet we're passive about it. Right? In the end, I took this can of medicine, which was candy, and I would throw it out and they'd all jump on and eat it. But, but uh, well, yeah, give teenagers candy. That was probably a bad idea. Uh, but uh, the point is, is, you know, when we have, when we have something that is that crucial to somebody's existence in life, and yet we're careless with it, you know, it just puts it in perspective. But that, that's, that's a, I guess, what do they call that? A, um, not a summary, because that's what you do after. Pre-something. Uh, anyway, for what is coming in the chapter. So, satisfied with what you have? Don't promise God promises you're not going to keep. And if you swear you're going to give him some money, you better give it. <laughs> they told, it the, told her to the feet of the men that buried your husband are here to carry you out. Whop in the floor. Bad deal. You know what I mean? I, I really do. Like, I don't ever promise my kids anything. Because I know I can't always make the promises, mm -hmm. even when I have tension, because sometimes circumstances don't allow for it. And so, when the Bible says, let your yay be yay and nay be nay, you don't swear, mm -hmm. which to me is like a, a promise. You know, so like, I always tell them, I will try to the best of my ability to do this, but I cannot promise you anything. So if I can't, reality. If I can't make it happen, I think that's, maybe that's why... I just always grew up where, still to this day, my dad does it. My mom and dad, my mom's plus her heart, she's passed away and all that. They had good intentions. Still, my dad will promise to do everything for me. He's never done anything for me, ever. And so, but he means well. It used to make me really mad that he would do that. But you know what it was? He, need, he wants to do it, you know? So, like, um, I just don't believe in promising people anything. And I have believed that since I was a child because... My parents have promised me a lot and never followed through with any of it. And so, I guess maybe that's why, honestly, 
outside of my children, I promise to try to raise my children to love God. Mm -hmm. That's the one promise that when I had when I birthed all three of them, I said, God, I was being on a promise to. So besides that, I've never, I've never promised that they were thought, ever promising God something but that's because I think in my mind, I was taught very early on a promise can be broken like that. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's where I teach, I teach my children because of that. I will not ever promise anything. And I tell them, you never promise them something to anyone. You, if you could do it, you say, yes, I will do that. But if there's a chance that you can't do that, even a possibility, you say, I will try my best. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. I, I totally that's, agree. That's that. And that, that's just because promising hurts people. I mean, you can't, even if you intend, like, even if you intend to the fullest of your ability to keep that promise, you can't, you can't assure that. What if something happens? You can't assure that you're going to keep it. You cannot do that. You know, I just, it's not, it's not as, even sensible. As a pastor, there have been times when people wanted me to promise them that somebody was going to, the help was going to come back, or they were going to survive this whatever it is they were going through. And, and they would think as a pastor that I could promise them that and pray and it would happen. And, and you can't, I can't promise those things. And, and when I, if I'm saying something on behalf of God, it better come from God. Just like when Paul said, you know, I charge you therefore before the Lord and, you know, Jesus Christ. And, and, and he is saying, what I'm about to tell you is straight from God. If you ever say that, it better be from God. Uh, so, you know, I could promise you the things that God has promised in Scripture, but beyond that, that's it. You know, a, a child says, well, you know, is this going to be okay? It may not be. It may be difficult. It may not work out the way you want it to. Uh, so you, you, you can't promise those things. Um, you know, I get called out sometimes. So, you know, I have to be careful promising the kids we're going to do this or do that because sometimes i got to go work on a walk-in freezer. <laughs> you know, things like that happen. So, you know, with God, a promise is God knows our intentions from the get-go. He knows whether we're going to be able to uphold the promise or not. So I would just advise being extremely cautious and careful into saying anything to God as a promise. Uh, more of, you know, I will let God lead me, guide me, direct me. And uh, uh, because every one of us will fail. And the Bible says so. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one. And I am definitely in that crap. Uh, except for I have the blood of Jesus Christ in my life to provide the righteousness that I need. And the only promise that, that I truly can give is that I'm going to be in glory. And you can be too. Past that, <laughs> I don't have it. I think there is a scripture verse that tells us not to let our right hand know what our left hand is mm -hmm. going to do. Uh, so that you going to be uh, not to promise something. Tomorrow, because I don't know if I have it tomorrow. Got to take care of today first. Today. That's right. I got now. You know, five first. minutes now, but I got now. And the first commandment with with a promise is <laughs> honor thy father and thy mother. Mm -hmm. That the days on the earth may be long. It doesn't say they will yeah, be long. long. They may be. That's right. That it may be. Yeah. Well, I've told you my opinion on that. Yes. Promise. And and that's that, that's very understandable. Yeah, it's just a very practical way. Yes. Do what your mom and dad says, that's and you right. survive. That's right. <laughs> you know, don't stick your your fork in the outlet. <laughs> yes. right. You know, and you'll live long. I mean, there's just a very practical way to look at that. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's a command from God, yeah. but you know, very practical way to look at that. So, in the family with peace and comfort as they wait on you. God, I pray that any other request that we've had, Lord, that uh, we lift up to you, that you would just uh, move in a mighty way. God, we know that in each trial and tribulation, you can be glorified. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would uh, 
Make opportunities in each situation uh, for your son, Jesus Christ, to be made known. God, we pray for this church. We pray, Lord, that the, the ministries here, that you would continue to bless in Jesus' name.